We are back with another episode of Dynasty Decisions. We break down your fantasy teams, your decisions, your rookie picks, your trades, your rebuilding and contending questions. That is what we do over here on this channel. As always, if you want your team broken down, easiest way to do so is to skip the line, head to flockfantasy.com and use the promo code FSE when you sign up for 30% off and a seven day free trial. But let's not waste any time. Let's get right into the first team. All right, so let's kick things off with Seth, who is in a sicko level format here, a 16-team PPR best ball, six point per passing touchdown. So at least it's a one quarterback. 16-team, two quarterback leagues are always terrible. It is a start eight. Justin Herbert, Deshaun Watson are his main guys. Nothing really going on at running back. T. Higgins, Jaden Reed, Rasheed Rice, Xavier Leggett. Uh, Dontavian Wicks, Jalen Polk, and some other guys at wide receiver. Trey McBride and Brock Bowers and Michael Mayer at tight end. And then he's already had his rookie drafts. He kind of indicates where he selected certain players. And then it looks like he has a banked up extra first rounder in 2025. So um, he basically says uh, he's been lurking for six months or so, but he finally uh, decided to take the plunge and sign up on the site. Really appreciate that. And he said um, this league was his first orphan last year. So middle of the road team that he stripped down, made some mistakes. Obviously he said he traded Mostert before the season, drafted QJ too early in the rookie draft last year. But he said he thinks the team is finally taking some shape. Uh, and he said, I know at least one more solid off season from actually contending because the running back class is going to be a lot better next year. And the fact that he has like none on his roster right now. And he said, he's planning to sell Watson in season um, after a boom bust week or two. Uh, and then he said, should I hold Higgins? Yeah. Should I trade him now for 2025 picks? I was offered a late first and a second for him straight up. And no. he said, lastly, the Drake London owner has interest in my tight ends. What would be a good offer to send? So a lot to unpack there. First off, what is your thoughts on the first kind of question for him of the T Higgins for the first and the second. That's garbage. I'm seeing some of the, some of the trades you already made. You traded away Kenneth Walker in the three Oh five for the one fourteen and a 25 late first. I would much rather have Higgins to Kenneth Walker. So if this guy's trying to penny pinch you with a late one and a two for, for Kenneth Walker, or not Kenneth Walker for T Higgins. No, like press the decline button. Say, Hey buddy, we're in different stratospheres here. A late first and second in a 16 team, one quarterback league. That's Fugaz. Yeah, yeah. You got to be at least guaranteeing me like a top 10 first, at least a, a minimum mid yeah. first or an early in a one quarterback potentially. Yeah, in a one quarterback league, man, like this is not, those are not neo moving assets. Like you look who you exactly. took at 114 here, Xavier Leggett type of, of profiles and in a class that was a lot deeper potentially than next year's class too. You definitely don't want to be accepting offers like that. He also says uh, the Drake London manager is interested in his tight ends. I mean, I would yes. sell McBride personally because McBride is generally an easier asset to sell for most leagues because he's already produced. He's already kind of been the guy. Bowers is a little bit more up in if the you air. you get the choice, yes. Whoever's more valuable, Drake London for them straight is a fine trade. Like I would be okay selling Bowers straight for Drake London or Trey McBride straight for Drake London. But yeah. he said what would be a good offer to send, which means I think he's probably going to have to pay more on top of those guys. If you to have to give Drake a London. two, so be it. If you have to give a two, so be it. I really couldn't be bothered. Like if that, even that's a t an early two, like an early two in a in a sixteen man league. Like let's just say that's the two o two or the two o three. Like you're literally talking about a, what the nineteenth overall pick at that point. Like if you're telling me again. I like McBride a lot, but if you're telling me I can move basically the equivalent of what would be, what would that be? The 207 and a 12 man league, especially knowing it's a one quarterback league, start eight league, go give me the needle, needle moving asset there with Drake London. Like you said, if you have the choice, I would move McBride, but ultimately I'm cool with either Bowers or McBride if I can get a deal done for Drake London. And I mean, speak, let's just address the elephant in the room how were you able to do this May 6th deal? Like what, what, what was the other guy actually thinking? This is borderline collusion. Yeah. Rashad Bateman, Kendra Miller, 207, 213. Maybe he loves this rookie class. I don't know. I'm just spitballing here. And 405 for Trey McBride and Jaden Reed. Like I would prefer each of the individual assets. By on the far. Side that you got over the other side of the package. By far. I mean, like I, again, kudos to you for being able to make this move. But like, was the guy pissed drunk when he made this? Like with this guy on the beach on vacation and with the family and he had a few too many wine sips or something? Because otherwise I can't really elaborate on why he would make this trade. <laughs> yeah, I guess his loss is your gain. I mean, Kenneth Amen. Walker in the 305 for 114 in a late first, also a pretty solid mm -hmm. move there, uh, given that you needed to kind of shed running back production off of your team. 
The challenging thing that you have ahead of you, the only thing that I'm a little bit worried about is the fact that you don't really have any means of getting running backs outside of the picks that you currently possess right now, which again, you can add a running back or two in next year's class, maybe three running backs. But the problem is if you make a London trade and you have to give up a second or whatever, and you're trying to consolidate assets, it's probably going to leave you in a position where you're not able to replenish your roster at running back because let's say everything breaks right for you. Your wide receiver core is awesome. Your quarterbacks are fine. Tight end, you move off of, say, McBride. McBride straight for Drake London or McBride in a third for Drake London or something like that. Are you going to have enough firepower ammunition to get the running backs that you're going to need to get to compete with just two ones, one projected late and uh, an early second, hypothetically. And that's why for me, this is more so a house money team in 2024. Maybe an opportunity rises where, I don't know, somebody's completely tanking and they're like, yeah, you know what? That 2025 early first, like, I'll give you two usable running backs for that. At that point, that's fine. But realistically, if that deal is unattainable, especially knowing the league market, knowing it's a 16-team, one-quarterback league, I think I would rather wait to see what exactly available is uh, or what's available in the rookie draft. So let's just say you end up, that early pick ends up being the 103 overall. That late pick ends up being, I don't know, the 114. Like that's just an easy, easy spot because you just traded the 114 or you got the 114 this year. If you're able to, uh, actually, I think the 2025 first is from the team that finished 114. So hypothetically, let's just say that ends up being the 114 again. 103, I mean, we talked about the running back rankings video, but that would be a fine opportunity to get a guy like Ashton Genty there, assuming that maybe wide receivers go one, two there with Luther Burden with Ted McMillan. Really, again, we're going to know the specific micro details of the pick once it would be on the clock. But projecting forward, we know those two wide receivers are going to be going high. We know Genty is going to be going high. And if I had to project a 2025 mock right now, those would most likely be the top three overall picks. And then at the 114, it's really just a pick your flavor at that point. At 114, I mean, we, we literally talked about 16 running backs in those two videos. And those 16 running backs are legit difference makers that can get second round plus cap or second round day two plus capital. Yeah, exactly. You're going to have opportunities to add running backs. It's just, is it going to be enough? Are you going to be able to add enough depth? So my strategy would be try and make more trades like the one you made on May 6th, where you can recoup more assets. Again, maybe those aren't realistic, but getting as much volume of assets as you can by say like Quentin Johnson gives a couple spike weeks. Maybe you sell them for a set, like an early to mid projected second during the season because it's a 16 teamer. Maybe you can get away with that. Rashid Shahid goes off in a couple of weeks. Maybe you can sell off on him doing stuff like that would probably be the best way to get more capital to fill out your running back core because at wide receiver, if you, if you hit on Leggett, if you hit on Polk, you're going to be in a pretty good spot. I would say, especially if you do make that Drake London trade. So for me, I'm I'm feeling okay about your roster, but you do definitely have some uh, some moves left to be made, and probably have to win a trade or maybe a couple to get this thing into contending shape in just one year's time. Otherwise, you're going to be waiting till 2026. Yeah, 100. percent But I mean, overall, considering you took this team over, uh, especially with a couple of uh, moves that you've already made, you're on a good path, man. Yeah, you got extra capital banked up in 2025, like we said. Play it by ear, see what's available. If nothing's available at a good value, like Corey said probably see what happens in that 2025 class but i think we can move on to the next team we spent about nine minutes on your team hopefully you got a good breakdown there we can spend more time on the next team here from ryan brolo he does say in the description uh startup draft was back in late february early march and he drafted from the 103 spot so let's take that context into the situation like you guys can see on the screen cj Stroud, brock purdy jj mccarthy bo nix kenny pickett a quarterback running backs there jonathan brooks isaiah pacheco david montgomery Najee harris etc there Wide receivers, Roma Dunze, DK Metcalf, Rasheed Rice, Jalen Polk, et cetera, there. And then at tight end, you do uh, you, you do need some help here. I'm just going to be honest. Michael Mayer, Theo Johnson, Luke Schoonmaker, Donald Parham, and Brenton Strange, along with what looks like basically the entire 2024 rookie class. He already had his rookie draft, so we can kind of go through where those spots ended up materializing, along with basically having all of his picks in 2025 and 2026, along with an extra mid-projected 2025 second. Yeah, I think you did a pretty good job out of the startup. Yeah. I mean, it, I look, it looks like you have a clear direction. You got a young team. You got a young wide receiver core that's pretty plentiful with like upside pieces. I'm not sure. I'm assuming they drafted rookie picks during the startup. If it was back in you know late February, early March, I'm assuming they drafted kickers as rookie picks or whatever. But um, yeah, I think this is a, a pretty good, a good stretch uh, out of the startup right now. He said, I got... Um, for down tiering and the rookies. Okay, actually, I'm just going to go over some of the trades that he made and then we'll kind of work back to some of the questions yeah. that he has here. So 
Day two of the startup, he sent away the 403 for Rasheed Rice, unfortunately. So it was Mark Andrews for Rasheed Rice in a second. Don't think that's a terrible move, but uh, definitely a sad face because Rasheed Rice lost some value there. Um, yeah. And then he said rookie draft trade. He ended up sending away the 105, which became Drake May, 206, which became Blake Corum, 406, Eric All. And he got J.J. McCarthy, Jonathan Brooks, and Bucky Irving. So basically what he said was, I prefer May over J.J. McCarthy and Malik um, to Rome is what he mentions in the next trade. Um, but he kind of down tiered to be able to get more depth, which is basically what he kind of suggests that he did here. So, I mean, if you would have held, I would have held too, but if you don't have huge, huge conviction on may over McCarthy, getting McCarthy plus basically Brooks over quorum is definitely a, a fine trade to make. I think No, it's definitely a fine trade. It's just, my issue is, you know, you already drafted a ton of running back equity in the startup. Honest to God, if you just told me that you're running back core of Pacheco, Montgomery, Najee Harris, yeah, it's a little weak on paper, but I think that's a fine running back core. I really would have wanted to allocate that second round pick to a wide receiver. And knowing that at the 206, again, he ends up taking Blake Corum, but maybe like a Leggett, a Peter Saul, you know, you end up taking Polk at 208. He would have been also, or 208, 301, who would have also been in consideration. Really, I just would have wanted to use that spot at a wide receiver. Again, if you don't see a big difference between May and McCarthy, upgraded one of those wide receivers to Jonathan Brooks startup value. We're talking about a difference of maybe one and a half rounds or so. But for me personally, again, I love my guy, JJ McCarthy. He is a three, four turn pick in my rankings over in dynasty, but Drake may is a guy I have valued in the mid second round. Like Drake may, I think is the most, in, uh, most misappropriated player on the market right now. Yeah, exactly. I, I think I'm on the same page with you there. He also mentions too, like, it's kind of, I mean, he, he basically outlines a seller's market. He said, there's nobody that went hard rebuild out of the startup. Like he says, he's probably one of the biggest rebuilders out of the startup. And there's yeah. also no like super teams, obviously, because this team was just drafted. But if there's like eight or nine or maybe 10 teams that think they could compete, Isaiah Pacheco, David Montgomery, Najee Harris, some of the assets that you admittedly say, I need to sell during the season. I just took them because they were good values in the startup. You should have a couple buyers available for those yeah. guys. If everybody thinks they're competitive. Yeah, 100%. And the other context here uh, for this deal, he ends up getting... Uh, so you see, obviously, Roman Dunze, Bo Nix in his squad. He ended up getting those guys in return for Malik Neighbors and the 209, a.k.a. Ben Sana. And again, fair value deal, especially if you don't see a discernible difference between Malik Neighbors and Roma Dunze upgrading that 209 pick to the 112 Bo Nix. Fine, fine idea. But for me personally, knowing that you did need more firepower at wide receiver, again, I love Rome. Like I said with JJ, he's a guy that I would value in the mid-third area of startups, mid to late third. Malik Neighbors for me, though, is just a tier above. And I understand, again, value-wise, it makes sense. And if you know you can sell Bo Nix in season for a good amount of liquidity, I actually don't mind the move. But you're also taking a risk because you're adding a fourth quarterback here to have to move at a later date. Yeah, I think I, I mean, maybe McConkey, Brian Thomas, and Worthy were off the board. But if you passed on one of those guys, I definitely would have just selected the wide receiver. Yeah, like if you if you subbed in any of those wide receivers, like Lad, Worthy, Brian Thomas, into that spot instead of Bo Nix, and you told me, okay, I needed a wide receiver. I ended up moving Malik Neighbors and Ben Sanat in exchange for Romo Dunze and one of those wide receivers. I would have been like, okay, no, I understand the process here. Start 10 league. You're a little bit weak in terms of your wide receiver depth. Fine move. It's just for me, taking Bo Nix in that spot to be your fourth quarterback, like you're just inheriting so much more risk, assuming that it's the type of league, co uh, league quarterback market that we usually see. Again, the way we see it in our leagues for the most part, the high-value quarterbacks have a lot of tradability. But once you kind of get down to the quarterback 18 to 24 range, which is about where Bo Nix is, like you really have to find a specific person that needs that type of quarterback added to their team in season. And again, because you have four quarterbacks, who knows? Maybe you find a godfather offer for Purdy or a godfather offer for McCarthy. And I mean, I wouldn't move Stroud, but if somebody's saying, hey, I'll offer you Justin Jefferson, a early to mid projected first for him, like at least now you're open to be able to make that type of move. So again, you'll know your market more than us. And maybe these quarterbacks are easier to trade than our experience in some of our leagues. But I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, it's a six point per passing touchdown league. It's a best ball format. So even if you don't, you don't have to trade Bo Nix. In a best ball with four quarterbacks, you don't have to trade Bo Nix. If your team becomes competitive because you can hit on your picks and stuff and you're able to just roll with all four of these quarterbacks, it is best ball. It's not like you have to choose That's to fair. start, you know, two of these guys every single week. So I would say if there's a format to do it, it definitely makes sense to do it in best ball. 
The other thing is, I mean, it is possible that Worthy went 109, McConkie went 110, and Thomas went 111. And Bonick was the best player on the board, and that's who you drafted because you took Brooks at at 201. So I'm assuming all the wide receivers were off the board because yeah. Bowers and the three wide receivers probably went 108 to 111. Yeah, no, that's definitely fair context, uh, assuming that actually happened, especially knowing it's a best ball. More likely, those wide receivers would probably go higher. So, And he might have made this deal with the context that, you know, he's selling off the 105. If he drops down to 112, he'll get one of those wide receivers, and he just didn't. And that's how the board went. And you know what I mean? Like, when he was selling 105 for 106, he's like, oh, I'll probably net J.J. McCarthy and Lad McConkie or Brian Thomas or Xavier Worthy out of this. And then he ends up having to take Bo Nix because that's the best player on the board. And essentially he was kind of just screwed by taking them there. So um, I think it's fine. I think he's in a, a really good spot overall, to be honest. Um, I would just worry about, you know, your solution long-term at tight end. You now have to sell off a lot of these running backs and you're kind of risking that, you know, David Montgomery gets hurt or something like that. And he loses a lot of value. But for the most part, I think if you can sell off, say Montgomery, Najee Harris, those types of guys in season for like seconds in 2025 or better, yeah, um, you're going to be in a, a pretty good spot to be able to fill out the rest of this roster. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> did you notice this little piece of context? At the time, I was super high in Rasheed thinking he can uh, get into the top 10 range of wide receiver, but then he was super high and became Krishi Rice. Yeah, that's, that's pretty Rice. funny. I'm not going to lie. So, I mean, looking at Ryan's team, I mean, I'm sure he actually mentions 100 out of 100 fab, so he didn't do the classic thing that he always does and try and collect hey, $6,000 in fab dude. every single uh, startup trade that he ends up Let doing. Let me get but, a little uh, rant off of that. Like, not long, just like tw- 10 seconds, but... Ryan, I got to tell you right now, every single time you send me a trade offer and I see seven fab going back your way, 90% of the time, I don't even read what the trade offer is because it just annoys me that the fab is in there. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, I'm on the same page. It's always, you got to start up offer from uh, from Ryan. He offers you uh, a, a three three pick drop down and it could be like a half decent trade, but he just throws in $12 of fab and it just makes you want to <laughs> claw annoying. your own skin off. But anyways, you're in a good spot. Like I said, uh, I think you should be able to rebuild this thing into a good team. Let's move on to the next one here from Wanye, a start eight, uh, one quarterback league, 12 team PPR, half tight end premium with Kyler Murray, Deshaun Watson, Daniel Jones, Jonathan Brooks, Blake Corum, Kendra Miller, pretty young at running back there. Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors, Drake London, DJ Moore, Xavier Worthy, Lad McConkie, Troy Franklin, Dontavian Wicks, very strong at wide receiver. And then a very me tight end core of Pat Fryermuth, Ben Sinat, uh, Jatavian Sanders, and other guys there. Looks like he has all of his future picks minus his two and his three in uh, 2026. And he said this is a, a, a draft that he did about a week ago. So pretty good for just out of a startup. I, I'm really just impressed with what you came away with. Like, I, I don't know how you got both Marvin Harrison and Malik Neighbors in a and one London. quarterback startup. Like both of those guys should have been, maybe they fell to the one, two turn. I'm not exactly sure how you got both of those guys, but at one away, he probably got like Marvin and then, you know, in the second round got Malik Neighbors. I think, that's I'm guessing what happened unless he traded up for some of those players. But for the most part, I look at this team and yeah, it's like you're weak at running back, but things could break right for your running back core and a house money team. Like if Blake Corum becomes the starter for the Rams because Kyron gets hurt or Kendra Miller takes a step forward or Kamani Vidal or Antonio Gibson, Damian Pierce have some value. This is the type of team that, yeah, you're not pigeonholed into competing with, but you probably could if, if your rookies perform and things break right for you. Like I, I don't think it's outrageous to say that you're a competitive team year one and maybe you sneak into the playoffs and who knows what happens after that, but you're well set up in the future. Minus the fact that you don't have your two and your three in 2026. I think come this time that you spend your 2025 capital, you should be a, a tried and true real deal contender. Yeah, for sure. And uh, now I understand how you got Marvin Harrison. So what I'm assuming happened is you probably took Malik neighbor slash Drake London at your turn because he actually ended up trading for Marvin Harrison Jr. So as you can see here, June 9th, 2024, he made two deals. First deal here, he has ended up receiving Jonathan Brooks and Marvin Harrison Jr. in exchange for Jonathan Taylor and Brandon Ayuk. Yeah, two very quality high-end picks in a one quarterback league with Jonathan Taylor with Brandon Ayuk. Marvin Harrison Jr. is my 104 in a startup. In a one-quarterback league, how would you treat a 104 startup pick in a super flex? They're worth a freaking load. And again, Jonathan Taylor, Brandon Ayuk, very, very good players. But every single day of the week, I would do that for Marvin Harrison on his own. So getting Jonathan Brooks tagged on this deal, I mean, just give yourself a freaking clap. Yeah, I mean, I look at it. I think it's a it's a fine deal. I don't disagree with anything very that fine you said, trail. but... You would very much be like in a competitive window if you had kept Ayuk and Jonathan Taylor. So I guess that's what you're kind of sacrificing a little bit is that you probably are more so guaranteed a house money team, but you offload 
some contract risk with Ayuk. You offload some, uh, you know, age and touch risk with Jonathan Taylor to better suit your long-term winning window. I think that's kind of the trade-off that you made here, and I'm fine making it. Well, the question I have for you, Bush, if that said CeeDee Lamb, Justin Jefferson, Jamar Chase, just on their own, we'd be advocating for the C.D. Lamb, Justin Jefferson, Jamar Chase side. I actually prefer Harrison and Brooks to C.D. Lamb, Justin no. Jefferson, or Jamar Chase. Yeah, that wasn't the point. I basically meant like that's a completely different deal. If that just said C.D. Lamb, Justin Jefferson, Jamar Chase on their own, like let's just say Marvin Harrison Jr. and Jonathan Brooks wasn't even in the deal, you would rather have one of those top three receivers. The point I'm trying to make is I think Marvin Harrison Jr. may at least be in that group, possibly the top of that group by next year. And you also tagged a Jonathan Brooks on this deal. So like, like I said, and I love the, the value here. Too. Yeah, absolutely. So I love the value there. This one, a little bit trickier with the value. Again, Friar Muth, you needed a tight end. I that, that's my it. guy, dude. I, I'm fine with this deal. I, Noah I, Fant to me is like people uh, how co- much co- more count on Noah Fant all the time. Like he's going to turn into something and maybe he will. Maybe he's the next David and Joku. But essentially, I look at this deal as like you sold a really late round startup pick and a second rounder in 2026 for a tight end that I absolutely think has a chance to take a big time step forward and be a top six guy this year. So maybe I'm just high on Fryermuth, but I, I, I'm i fine with it. seems expensive. Deal. Like I'm fine with him when you get him for cheaper. Well, what else, how are you going to get a tight end for less than a second round pick? See, I actually don't think Noah Fant's a nothing. Like that's I, I think he. I don't think he's a nothing. I just he's. We've been waiting for Noah Fant to be something for like seven years. It feels like, yeah. and he hasn't been anything. I would just rather go more expensive and buy production, or go older and buy. I mean, how much more expensive would like? Really, how much more expensive? You mentioned David and Joku. How much more expensive would David and Joku be than this? Guy? I would rather do this deal than pay more for David and Joku. No. What if you're if not it getting no- David and Joku for Noah Fant in a second. You're going to have to give up more than that. How much more? In a tight end premium league, probably first round equity no in totality way. of the deal. Maybe not an actual first round pick, but pick, uh, like picks or a combination of assets that equals first round equity. And to me, I would much rather take the shot on Fryermuth because I don't the way think I operate be- a tight end, especially knowing that you're in a house money team where Fryermuth's situation could change in one year's time where he has a young, exciting quarterback or they trade for a quarterback or something like that. I'm taking this Fryermuth deal over paying close to first round equity, which it would cost you in a uh, start eight tight end I, premium league. David and Joku would have close to first round value. I guarantee it. I think it would probably cost you Fant the 20, 25, two and three at max. If, if that's what it costs you, I, I agree with you, but that's not what it would cost you. I guarantee you I, don't get him for that. I, I, I don't see no, uh, David and Joku getting first round capital. Like in no startup, I, I, even dude, in tight I've end. Been try- I tried to the, buy David Joku so league. much last year when he was breaking out. Like I was literally tight end one after week eight last year. No, he's good, but at the same time, we are, we're in a one point seven five or two point oh. What what is the scoring for Debbie? One point seven five. He went at the eight oh six. Like you're straight up, you're not getting first round equivalent value for an eight oh six pick in the tight end. I mean, I mean, you took Kittle in the same range. I took Jacobs in the same range. I think you could get a, a, a first for those type of assets if you were in a competitive window. You could, but you're not getting a first on top of Noah Fan. No, but Noah Fan, I, I, you're overvaluing Noah Fan. In my opinion, <laughs> Noah Fan's worth like a third round pick. Like he's not really worth I, anything to me. I don't know. I don't feel that much more confident in Firemouth than Noah Fant this year. But I mean, I guess you know what? You get younger. If you're higher, like Corey on Firemouth, it's probably a fine price to pay. I just, I would have probably rather seen what other options would have been available in that range. I mean, we just mentioned George Kittle. For talking about just straight up, well, he doesn't equity. fit this team as well as Fryermuth does, though. That's the only thing, and he's more expensive. He's going to score way more fantasy points. Yeah, but he's more expensive, also. Sure, way sure. more expensive, I, I, like five rounds of startup value. Sure, sure. I don't know. I, I just think you're 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 upgrading your tight end two into another tight end two. I don't know. The way I look at Fryermuth is this: I think he projects very similarly to Jake Ferguson, except he's seven rounds. Well, one plays in a top five offense, and one plays in a bottom five offense. That's fine, but there's no CD lamb in his offense. Sure. I mean, they're also going to score 17 points per game. <laughs> Probably. <Like. laughs> That's fair, but that, the situation could change very quickly in, in Pittsburgh. If Russ is a good enough quarterback to, to support a Pat Fryermuth breakout, and then they like upgrade at quarterback next off season, I feel like Fryermuth could really, there, we're one off season removed from Fryermuth being like a top seven dynasty tight end. And he really didn't do anything in his second year or his third year to make me think that he's not going to be a solid tight end in the NFL. I don't know if you're, if you're, it's probably a fine price. I, he's just not going to be my preferred option there, but we're spending way too much time talking about Pat Frymouth. I mean, overall you're in a good situation. You have 
basically outside of your second and third in 2026, the rest of your remaining draft capital, you're loaded at wide receiver. Yes, you need a little bit for, to break it uh, right at running back and tight end. But I mean, overall, I think you're in a good spot. I think we can move on to the next team here. And that's going to be from A. Bailey. So the context he says before I read off the team is that he submitted this team a few weeks ago before his rookie draft with some questions about who to take at each spot. And he does say that he thinks that the draft played out pretty well for what he was trying to accomplish. So we'll read the team. We'll read uh, the rest of the context he gives here. And yeah, let's just get into it. So at, in terms of the team, starting quarterback, Justin Herbert, Kyler Murray, backup quarterback here with Michael Penix at the 204. Nice little value spot for him to be your quarterback three. I think that's about perfect opportunity cost for this team. You have two studs. You get a guy like Michael Penix, eighth overall capital, 204. I mean, his, his value can go up tremendously if he gets any playing time in the next couple of years. Running backs here, a classic, you know, zero RB type of core. Charbonnet, Corum, Jalen Wright uh, as your main guys. Again, not guys you're going to bank on for consistent production, but guys that all have upside in their relative offenses. Wide receivers absolutely loaded to the rim. Marv, Malik. Drake London, T. Higgins, La McConkey, Jalen Polk, uh, Ricky Pearsall, Marvin Mims, Jalen Coker. Love that. And then a tight end, you're able to get Brock Bowers at the 112. So I'll uh, I'll read some more of this context in a second. But holy crap, Brock Bowers 112? You're the tight end hater. And I think you would snap that up every single time you could get the chance. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, how did he fall to 112 if Xavier Worthy was on the board at 202 as well? Because he traded up from 202 uh, with the 304 to get the 112, but Worthy was on the board at 202. So I'm guessing Keon Coleman went super high or something like that. And that's why Bowers was uh, was sliding. People just focusing too much on the landing spot there. But excellent move. I mean, just in a vacuum, 202 and 304 to get up to 112 where Bowers had slid to. Great move there. He sends away the 201, which became Trey Benson. He traded back basically to get Michael Penix, a second rounder, and the 306 Blake Corum, getting more picks in a loaded rookie class. And I'd actually, like we talked about Blake Corum as a potentially overvalued asset in rookie drafts this year, but 306, 306 I'm very much yeah. fine with him at that point. He was more so going at like the 208 in a lot of rookie drafts. I only had a real problem once he was like 205, 206. Like late second round, you wanted to take Corum and you're not a believer in Kyron Williams. I think that makes a ton of sense. So the fact that you got him at the 306, absolutely love that. He does say here as well, I felt like Bowers at the 112 was great value and shared up one of my weakest positions. I think you're absolutely spot on with that analysis. I don't know how he felt the 112. Again, comment down below if you're watching the video right now how the first round went. But if Worthy and Bowers are going 112-202, I have to know what the rest of the board is. Like, is Jonathan Brooks Bro going 106? Brooks must have went higher, and uh, Coleman must have went higher. That's, that's the quarterbacks? The because Benson and, and Worthy went in the second round as we gleaned from the, the trades. Yeah, no, uh, that is... That is pretty wild here. He says, uh, my question now is a team that I look to buy running backs and try to compete this year or with how many rookies I should have or I have, should I look to punt and make a push for next year? So you have three seconds in 2025 along with your first, your third, and your fourth. This Honestly, looks so much like my no flocking team. This is a house money and minus the, the solidified tight end because as it's been well documented and I don't have a tight end in that league, but this team is like so many rookies, so much upside. Just wait and see. Like if, yeah, if Charbonnet, like if Walker goes down week one and Charbonnet's a stud running back and Corum takes over that backfield, Jalen Wright's giving you some good production. Yeah, maybe you could compete this year, but there's a very good chance that your team is going to be an absolute monster by 2025. So stay the course. Don't get too aggressive unless you absolutely are on a tear to start the year six and one or something like that. And a two of your 2025 seconds will buy you Josh Jacobs to help you compete. Then don't, don't make any moves to try and push this thing in because this has the makings of a monster come 2025. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, you alluded to it. Xavier Worthy plus Mal uh, Malachi Corley in exchange for Brock Bowers. I'm making this move every single time in your situation. Again, I love Worthy, but knowing that this is a start nine league, you need a tight end. You're absolutely loaded at wide receiver. Malachi Corley, like sure, I guess if you're a Jets fan, it's got a little bit of upside. Yards after catch player, pretty fun gadget player, but I mean, you needed a tight end and you arguably got a guy that has the ceiling to be the number one at his position in a start nine league. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's an easy trade to make. He also mentions like, should I be trying to sell anybody? Like, is there any um, immediate sells on his team? And also, um, maybe Higgins is one of those guys because he's like the oldest of his wide receiver core. But to be honest, man, I, I I'm not in the rush to sell Higgins. You're going to be competitive next year, and like, Higgins might either be on a new contract or on a new team. So I don't really know exactly what the situation yeah. is. The only guy that sticks out to me 
as a guy that maybe you could consider selling because there's younger assets that have more upside around his range is Justin Herbert. If you could get Anthony Richardson or somebody like that in the same range who have more Love. point production upside who are younger, then maybe that's a guy that you would consider selling if it's like not costing you much. Like if you can sell Herbert straight for Richardson, that's something I would do, but if it's going to cost you Herbert and two twos or something, then don't no. do that. Like, yeah, I mean, like, it's not even that pressing because it is a six point passing touchdown league. Like, maybe, sure, one for one Richardson, one for one Love, one for one. I mean, you have Kyler Murray, but that would have been another name I would have said. Like, one for one, sure, like you could have considered it. But again, in a six point passing touchdown, yes, I understand the over volu overall volume of the Chargers situation doesn't look great on surface level. But I mean, Justin Herbert should still be a guy that. I mean, if he's fully healthy, if the wide receivers like Ladd, like, you know, Josh Palmer are to stay healthy, I think he can have a quiet little bounce back here. Again, I'm not projecting it. He's only like my quarterback 16 in redraft. But if anybody's going to take the 2022 Patrick Mahomes route, it's going to be the guy I think is the fourth best quarterback in football. <laughs> right. But I would argue if he does finish quarterback 16 in Dynasty, he'll be a third round starter pick. I, I don't see that. Maybe not. Maybe he's just back a real life quarterback, but that will be like year three in a row where Justin Herbert has completely disappointed relative to ADP. So that's the only thing yeah. I have with Herbert is like I can if I can get Richardson or somebody with a higher production ceiling with a higher value accumulation yeah. ceiling as well. Because if Richardson has a monster year, he's gonna be a top five startup pick. I, I would I would explore those options. It's not like I think Herbert is an absolute must sell across all formats. It's that if you have a young team already and you can maybe sell Herbert for a guy with more upside, then I'd be cool doing it. Yeah, I, I just I don't buy that he would be a third round startup pick because I mean Trevor Lawrence didn't have a great year last year. He's going in the mid second. Like I just don't see Herbert going past the range he currently is. To be honest, that's fair. But Lawrence's offense projects the same as it did last year, whereas Herbert's, if he has like a 520 pass attempt season and it's the same coaching Maybe. staffs, the same weapons around him, and he's now disappointed for like three years in a row in terms of his overall ADP. It's possible that the market would sour on him, but that's a separate discussion, probably. <laughs> yeah. Um. With A. Bailey's team, man, I, this is just the type of team that you just kind of uh, check in on throughout the year. If you have a good record, maybe make a move or two. But for the most part, you're you're going to be looking to build this thing into a monster come 2025. Yeah. Maybe, too, if like, you know, Jalen Wright's having a monster breakout and his price really skyrockets, you could cash out for more capital in 2025. But if that's yeah. the case, you might have just hit on a young running back and you don't want to do that anyway. All right, so let's move on to the next team here, which is from Emerson. And just to reference Emerson, you need to submit this team via Excel or Google Sheets because we had to jump through hoops to try and get this thing to even be functional on the screen. So just keep in mind how to submit the team is listed in the Google form there. Just follow exactly what it says. And you should be able to just download the sheet, put your team in, and then submit it that way via Excel and Google Sheets just for reference going forward. 10-team uh, league, Kyler Murray, Trevor Lawrence as the main quarterbacks. Not a whole lot going on at running back outside of some young names and maybe a production piece like Zeke. Wide receivers, Rasheed Rice, Jaden Reed, and not a whole lot else. And then Trey McBride is your only real tight end asset that matters. So this team's not in really good shape. He said he's a full-on rebuild. Uh, we don't have his picks listed here because we had to kind of um, piece together his submission here. 101, 107, 201, and 401 are the picks that he has in 2024. Has not had his rookie draft yet. And then all of his future picks plus an extra one and an extra two in 2025. So he does have some draft capital going to be adding, say, Harrison and maybe Romo Dunze to this team. But this is the type of team that you need volume of great assets because your flex positions are just straight up bad. So trading down from 101 or trading, you know, the 107 into like a later first rounder and a future first or something like that, definitely the types of moves that I would be looking to explore because your team needs a lot. Outside of quarterback and tight end, you're in rough shape. Yeah, I mean, we, we got to keep it straight with you, Brian. Like, there's two usable assets long-term here, and that's assuming Rasheed Rice is on good behavior. Like, you got Rasheed Rice, you got Jane Reed, and the rest of it is just third-round or worse assets. Like, rookie third-round or worse assets. So, 10-team league, man, like, yeah, you're going to have to start getting active. Again, that's why you submitted to us. That's why we're willing to help you, man, because ultimately here, there's a lot of work you're going to need to be doing. Yeah, and he mentions, like, his leagues are pretty sharp. His league's pretty sharp too. And they value draft capital heavily. So, I mean, you're going to have a tough, tough battle in front of you here. He said, your plan is to compete in 2026. I don't want to hear the word compete come out of your mouth until your team looks even remotely ready to compete, to be honest. Like a, yeah. it's a 10 team league too. Like your team should look a lot better than this in a 10 team yeah. league. So for me, it's like, if your league values draft capital heavy, that means they also value rookies heavily. So you should be able yeah. to get a good return for a guy like Marvin Harrison jr. Or a guy like, 
you know, Romo Dunze or whoever is there at the board on the board, like a JJ McCarthy or something like that. If you have to shoot for 2026 capital because they don't want to give away 2025 picks, 20 if you can sell Marvin Harrison Jr. for let's say a late first this year of a, a, a mid projected first in 2025 and a mid projected first in 2026, unfortunately your team is in a position where you kind of just have to do that. And same yeah. goes for anybody that's worth anything on your team. If, if somebody wants to give McBride. you a nice two for JK Dobbins and Kendra Miller, they can have them. You know what I mean? Like you're just, you're moving any and all non draft capital assets, try and monopolize the 2025 and 2026 classes because outside of really quarterback and tight end, you're not really in a position to compete anywhere. And even Lawrence, Kyler Murray and Trey McBride, if you got really, really good draft capital asset type of deals for them, I would be okay moving those guys as well because this team is quite far away. Yeah, this team needs a ton of turnover. This is like when a business just wipes their hands on all of their unsold merchandise and just tries to get rid of it at as big of a sale as it possibly could. Again, obviously, you're not going to say, hey, I'm selling like my key assets for 40, 50 cents on the dollar. But I mean, when we're talking about like QJ, Kendra, Zeke Elliott, Kenneth Gainwell, Chuba Hubbard, et cetera, all of those names there. Like, I understand, like maybe there's not a deal you feel great about, but even if it's, at least 85 90 cents plus on the dollar like you're in a position where you have to take it to be honest like and again we hate saying like oh you have to take this deal but i i gotta be honest with you man this is like a really really rough team yeah and i mean your goal next year is also to secure luther bird and ted mcmiller whoever yes. 101 is in 2025 as well so that goal is furthered by the fact that you can sell off if josh palmer starts producing 26 three and he's off my team like get him off your get any productive uh, productive assets that are not um long-term staying power type of guys off of your roster into the future because that is when you're going to actually be ready to compete come 2026 you said your plan is to compete by then i mean maybe if you hit on all of your draft picks that, that maybe you could compete by then but you're not even going to probably be even a house money team by 2026 yeah i mean like straight up you got what? Unless you Who's win a bunch top? of trades and you, you know, fleece a bunch of people, then come 2026, maybe we're looking at your team and you're like, yeah, it's the house money team. You got five players. Am I counting that right? Five players that are getting selected in the first 10 rounds of startups in a 10 man league. Like you need. Yeah. Work. I mean, he has picks too. Like, hey, like the one. Yeah. 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 No, I'm just saying straight roster. Yeah, it, no, exactly. And yeah. one, but like, if you added, if you put Harrison Odunze and McConkey yeah. on this team, they would look a lot better at wide receiver. You know what I mean? So that has to factor into some degree, but try to package as many guys as you possibly can to get future capital. That's pretty much your only move at this point. Like Danny said, anybody that's not a needle moving long-term staying power asset, you got to sell them for 60 cents on the dollar. You might have to do that because all the production that's on your team needs to be off of it so that you can tank your pick as easily as possible. He did make a trade where he sent away Kirk Cousins and Jonathan Taylor for Trevor Lawrence and Kendra Miller. That was a good move. I mean, that that future, you got a young quarterback who's got a big contract now. He doesn't need to be traded off your team. He's one of the few um, standalone starting assets that you have. And you moved off an old quarterback coming off an Achilles tear and a running back who's 25 or 26 years old. So great move there. Keep making more moves like that. 2026, honestly, is probably the, goal, the good goal for you. Because again, once you add some players, then you could say, okay, I need some running backs. But the problem is I would have needed more capital on this team to be able to say you're on that fast track to the rebuild. Cause quite frankly, only having an extra one and two for the future with this team, you would have needed a little bit more to fast track. Not to mention again, if this team or if this league has been standing for quite a bit, it's a 10 man league start 10, like straight up. Even if you hit on your draft picks in the next couple of years, like that probably gets you to the fourth to sixth best team at best. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Again, Hit on draft picks, try and make good trades. That's your goal for the future right now. So let's move on to the next team here, which is from uh, Jay Gav here. Let's move us down here. And uh, you guys can see that it is a 12-team PPR league, six point per passing touchdown, one full tight end premium, super flex format. Anthony Richardson, JJ McCarthy, Will Levis is the main quarterback. Zero RB, classic Trey Benson, Chase Brown, Jalen Wright, Zach Charbonnet, Ray Davis, Tyrone Tracy, who actually really liked that running back core, to be honest. Jamar Chase, Marvin Harrison, Drake London, Olave. Okay, this receiver core is mentally ill. Um, tight end, uh, Kyle Pitts, Tucker Craft. Greg Dolchich, and then it looks like he's already spent his rookie picks. I mean, I'm assuming he took Marvin with the 102 and so on and so forth. Does have an extra one banked up and a couple extra threes banked up as well. So he says, I feel he feels like he's probably at least one more year away from being competitive. Man, I look at this team and I think you could probably compete this year uh, if things broke right for you. Like if Benson takes over the job in Arizona Chase and Chase Brown, Brown uh, Jalen Wright gives you some good Tracy, weeks or Tyrone Davis. Tracy takes over the Giants job or something. 
I, I think this might be the type of team I would maybe go shopping for a running back because straight, I, I can't imagine there's a wide receiver core in your league that even rivals yours as well. I mean, would I like a better solidified quarterback core than Anthony Richardson, Will Levis, and JJ McCarthy to compete? Yeah, but there's some upside there. It's possible that Will Levis can get you by until JJ takes over and maybe he's the the starting guy there. So again, maybe a wait and see type of team. See how you're doing at week six. Are you five and one or are you one and five? If you're five and one, like that, this is the type of team that maybe the Jonathan Taylor manager is selling low because they're trying to rebuild or whatever. This is the type of team that you go into the season, you wait and see what you have. This is a prototypical house money team. Yeah, no, 100%. I mean, uh, he does say, I appreciate you guys' best Dynasty channel out there. I uh, appreciate that. And I can just tell right now from this team that you've been watching the content pretty consistently because, uh, yeah, this is a strong team you got here. Like Corey said, need a little bit to break right at running back. But, I mean, having absolutely stacked cores, especially at quarterback and wide receiver, having the former gold standard Kyle Pitts there along with Tucker Craft, you know, Noah Fan, Greg Dolchus, et cetera, as good tight end depth, man, like, Again, all you need to break right is the running back position, and this should be one of the best teams in the league. Yeah, I mean, looking at his trades he made, he sells off Nico for the 107. Again, given your receiver core, I totally understand that move. Get J.J. McCarthy there. I would prefer Nico in a vacuum, but given the state of your wide receiver core, I think that was a fine move. Jamison Williams, Traylon Burks, two guys that are busts, basically, uh, for a second in Rashid Shahid. I think that's fine. Uh, yeah. Trey McBride, you sell high on by the looks of it for a 2025 first, third, Trey Benson and Greg Dolchich. Good deal. I would have sold Pitts if I were you because ben, uh, McBride, I feel better about from a production Point standpoint, um, but I think it's fine. Yeah, and not to mention, you're, you're simply just not getting a trade like this for Kyle Pitts on this market, to be honest. So I uh, I don't mind it. Again, you needed a running back. You get a guy that we both have valued very high in the dynasty circles. You pocket an extra first round pick to be able to trade in season. I mean, who knows? We've seen some wonky shit. That says likely late, and obviously you have your own pick. The opportunity arises in season. The Christian McCaffrey owner faces injuries, and he starts out three and six, and he's wanting to get McCaffrey off his team because he's worried about his value tanking. I mean, you might be able to get Christian McCaffrey. Again, I, I don't want to throw hypothetical values out there because sometimes when we kind of say an underselling uh, of a value, people just get super mad in the comments, but who knows? Maybe that costs you that uh, a late one, two, and three to get Christian McCaffrey. Again, I'm not saying that is his current trade value, but if someone's panicked to get him off the team because they started bad and he is a, again, 28 going on 29-year-old running back that somebody scared will be valued like Derrick Henry in a year, that may be palpable. Yeah, yeah, and I like the last trade you made too. You sell off Lad McConkey and two twos for Chris Olave. I think Olave fits Fine your move. team really well. He's young, he's productive, and uh, he's going to help out your flex spot a lot more than McConkey would. And, and like, even if McConkey hits, I still think you're, you're talking about a pretty nutted range of outcomes that he becomes Chris Olave, or at least as valuable as Chris Olave right now. So, so I like that move for you. This is the type of team that you're just going to feel out and see exactly how things are shaking out for you during the season. And I believe you will be able to compete if a couple running backs hit, and you know, let you get good production out of one of your two quarterbacks, um, JJ McCarthy and Will Levis. Um, but yeah, this is a, this is a really good spot to be in. You're going to have at the very late, like worst case scenario, you're going to be in 2025 rookie drafts, adding running backs, and you're going to be off to the races in 2025. Yeah, for sure. So we can head on to the final team of the video again, a little bit longer, but we're blessing you guys, uh, on, on this fine day. We can move on to Arthur's team. He says here in the context, again, I'll read the team in a second. He says, we are one year out of the startup where I did a one year punt and avoided running back. He got ETN recently to get some running back production. So we'll uh, look at the team and then we'll get through some of these other questions. Quarterbacks here, you got Burrow, Kyler, Young, and a 10 team start, 10 super flex league. Running backs, ETN, Spears, Amir White, et cetera, there. Wide receivers stacked at the top there. Chase, Wilson, Ayuk, Flowers, Dotson, Douglas. And then at tight end, you have Jake Ferguson, Pat Fryermuth, and Tucker Kraft. So um, it, I believe it says he hasn't had his rookie draft. Hasn't had the rookie draft has, yet, no. Still has all those picks listed along with all of his picks in 2025 and 2026. Straight off the bat, without even addressing the loaded rookie picks you have, this is a very, very well-built shell. I'm just going to say it right now. The, the way you have your quarterback set, wide receiver strong at the top, solid tight end upside there, and then now you have your hammer at running back with some upside in behind. Those rookie picks are going to feel like, you know, shopping at – your favorite store, whether it's Nike, whether it's, you know, you, you go to the GameStop, you're picking out your games, your controller accessories, whatever the case may be, just enjoy the shopping session because quite frankly, you did your work here structuring the team the way you did. 
Yeah, I mean, he he mentions that he wants to trade up from 7, 107, to get 104 so that he go can secure it. both Romo Dunze and Malik Neighbors. Go nuts, dude. I, I think yeah, that's totally fine with me. It's like, would I rather have Drake May at 105 if he slides there? Probably, but Burrow, Kyler, and Bryce Young in a 10-team league, I'm fine taking Odunze over Drake May in that scenario. And yeah. he said, I know, I know, I sold Puka too soon and for far too little, but happy about selling some of the other guys that he had there. So he sells off Higgins and Puka Nakua um, week three of the season or week two of the season. For Garrett Wilson, I don't blame you for making I mean, that at move. least you got a solidified yeah. stud asset in the deal. That's that that feels good, at least. Exactly. A and B. Honestly, you're underselling yourself. Again, has it materialized great for you knowing that Puka and Garrett Wilson are basically a wash, and then the rest of the deal you basically sold Higgins for the two hundred two. Yeah, but at the time you made this deal, Garrett Wilson was a second round startup pick who was going at the one two turn in redraft leagues, and Puka Nakua was a complete unknown. So process wise, again, obviously people are like, oh, sometimes you got to say, you always say process over results. Sometimes you need the results. I understand that. But you make this deal nine out of 10 instances, it's going to work out for you. The one instance that didn't work out is when Puka Nakua literally set the freaking rookie receiving record, man. <laughs> like, yeah, no, like uh, that was a hundredth percentile range of outcome for Puka yeah. Nakua. Like most of us wouldn't have been surprised if he was like Travis Fulgham 2.0. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, we, if you watch the film and you were like, okay, he's going to be a good NFL player. Maybe he's a, a wide receiver 25 in dynasty. And that's what you sold him or something like that. But you were selling high at the time and people were excited about Puka Nakua. So yeah, that's a great move. The other moves, I guess they kind of net together where you sell off Waddle and basically, I guess, Marvin or Caleb Williams for the 103. Uh, and I'm assuming like he made uh, uh, trades after this, Jamar Chase. You got Jamison Williams in the 103 trade below that, and you also got the 107 in Travis Etienne. So I guess you net Chase, Etienne, 107, and Jamison Williams for Waddle and Caleb Williams or Waddle and Marvin Harrison. Jamo on the other side. So it'd be 101 Waddle and Jamo for 103, or sorry, uh, 107 Chase and Etienne. Pretty much. Yeah, which is a fair a fair move. And you also yeah. mentioned I'm trying to trade up 107, probably plus one of your twos to get Malik Neighbors, and that makes this deal look even uh, better Absolutely. in that situation. So yeah, I mean, going into your rookie draft, if you could walk away with Neighbors and Odunze at 201, maybe you you hold on to one of those seconds or something at 201 or 202, you can add Trey Benson or Jonathan Brooks to this team to fill out your running back core a little bit more. Maybe at 210, 301, 302, take some more swings on wide receivers and running backs. You're going to be in a really good spot. And he mentions, should I buy more running back production? Dude, if you go into the season with etn spears uh zamir sleeping white and like one a of the rookie running back one or twos you're going to be just fine at that position in my i'm opinion. sleeping like a baby with that core and again if I, I in season you realize hey maybe i want to make a running back upgrade stuff all your freaking future picks to be able to dangle around man like this is not the team i'm worried about trading a 2025 first on again obviously you have to pick the right package you're not just going to trade it for any player out there but like you play your cards right this should be a late projected pick yeah and I, if opportunities arise where you can get needle moving assets at either running back or tight end where somebody's super high on Tajay Spears and they want to give you Bijan for Tajay Spears in the 107 instead of you trading up for Malik neighbors like yeah absolutely go do that like or if somebody wants to give you um I'm trying to think off the top of my head someone wants to give you Brock Bowers for in the rookie draft for Jake Ferguson plus the 202 or something like absolutely go make deals like that again I'm, I'm spouting off trades that are obvious wins for you but Based on the trades you've made so far, I feel like those are actually on the table and actually possible for you. Yeah, 100%. So that is the end of the video. Appreciate you guys for sticking to the end. If you enjoyed, leave a like, subscribe to the channel if you're new around here. Also, if you do want your team covered in future videos, flockfantasy.com is the way to do so. Promo code FSE users only will get access to these videos. If you're an annual mother flocker or a mother flocker in general, you do get to be at the front of the line, then flockers are second. And then of course, if we ever get into any free submissions, which probably won't be till like next January, if I'm being hundred percent honest, um, we'll get to go in those videos. So again, flock fantasy link down below. If you guys do want to check that out. And uh, of course there's tons of other content, dynasty trade calculator on my team's feature, um, all of our rankings and all that kind of stuff. And our, our draft guide that will be coming over redraft leagues coming out very soon as well. So if that interests you link down below in the description, but with that being said, peace out. We'll talk to you soon.